Hey there! My name is Karen and I'm an instructor at Full Stack Academy. Over the next few minutes, I want to walk you through the experience of being a student in our remote immersive program. So let's get started. Before I go into any specific technologies, let's talk about your desk setup. It'll be a lot like the setup I have right here. You'll need a computer. We prefer that you use a Mac, but we do also support Windows and Linux computers. You'll need an external monitor, and you'll also need a stable internet connection. And that's all you need. In terms of the course itself, the remote immersives curriculum is exactly the same as the on-campus curriculum. That means you'd have the same access to workshops, lectures, and reviews, as well as live instructor support. So how we do this is we have an online learning platform which we call LearnDot. So let's take a quick tour of that. When you first log in, you'll see the workshops page. This shows all of the workshops that you've taken up to this point. So let's say, for example, you started off as a complete beginner and you decided to take Fullstack's JavaScript 101 course. This course just gives a quick taste of JavaScript and how you can apply it in the real world. If maybe you really enjoyed that and you wanted to take JavaScript Jumpstart online, this delves a little bit deeper into the specific elements of JavaScript. Then maybe you wanted to take our bootcamp prep course, which gets you ready and prepared for our online coding assessment to get into the immersive. So let's say that you get into the immersive and as soon as you're accepted you'll have access to our foundations workshop which is a four-week remote prep course that you would complete before starting the immersive. Then after that, each day or so during the immersive, you would have access to a new workshop that you would go through with a partner. So before each workshop starts, you'll actually have a live lecture by one of your instructors. The best way to experience the live lecture is to try out one yourself. There's actually one happening right now in our video classroom. So let's go into the video classroom using this green button for about four to five minutes so you can experience what a lecture would be like and how the students interact with the instructor. So we'll go in for a few minutes and then come right back out and complete the tour. Asynchronous with promises um, is still asynchronous, but um, it reads a little more like English. So you say, please start reading this file uh, and give me a promise for its results. And then, if you are successful, um, give me the buffer and I will console log that buffer. Or if you failed, give me the error and I will console log the error. Um, and then, either way, uh, you console log I am last. Now, all of those callbacks, now that you've registered them, will happen asynchronously so you can safely console log I am first again. And that will happen before any of those other things. Okay. Um, by a show of hands, does that more or less make sense to everyone? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to jump over to my text editor to um, do some code examples. So let's go to JavaScript syntax highlighting. And then, so let's say we've got a promise A, which is. Um, let's say, reading this uh, file demo.txt. So the first advantage of promises is that they are portable. Um, so a promise is just an object that represents an eventual value of an asynchronous operation. Um, so in this case, that asynchronous operation is reading the file. Um, but promise A is just an object that you can use as any other object. So let's say you want to do something uh, and pass in promise A. The function do something can do whatever it wants with promise A. Or if you're a node, you can module.export um, promise A. And if any other file requires this file, um, you'll be able to use the results of that asynchronous operation um, there. So they're portable. The second advantage is that you can have multiple handlers. Let's say you want to do something with the contents um, 
of promise A or of the file demo.txt. Uh, you can do that. So you can console log here. But later you want to do something else with them. Uh, promise A still contains the value of the contents of that file. And so you can do whatever you want here. Let's say you want to add some pluses um, to the front of the contents of the file, which would be silly, but you know, there you go. Um, and neither of these handlers will actually affect the contents of promise A. So the third advantage is that its uh, promises are linear. Let's just scroll down here. So let's say you've got promise A. Um, and you want to do something with it. Let's say, let's say we want to get the length of A. Um, and then I want to do something with that number. Let's say that's N. So if I were to do this, this reads kind of like English, like I said before. So first read this file um, and then uh, get its length and then add its length to five and then console log that number. <clears throat> um, and the magic of this is that, let's say we've got promise A, which is a promise for reading that file. Um, the thing that this dot then returns is actually a different promise. And in this case, it's a promise for the length of the file. Now, this dot then is a promise for the length of the file plus the number five. And finally, this promise down here um, is actually going to be a promise for undefined, but um, it will also console log um, that number. Um, and it reads like English, right? So promise, like read the file and then get its length and then add the number five to it and then console log it. So it's very linear. And the final advantage, um, let me just clear this uh, drawing, get that out of the way. Final advantage is unified error handling. So if you've got three vanilla asynchronous callbacks that you want to happen in order, um, you want those operations to happen in order, you have to nest um, each call within the callback of the previous call. Um, and in each one, you need to deal with whatever error might have happened uh, while performing that previous call. But with promises, you don't need to do that. You can just add one um, error handler, which you can do um, usually by attaching it via a catch, um, catch block. Um, and you can do whatever you want with this error. And if an error was thrown anywhere along the way, um, that error will uh, skip any handler between it and the first available error handler. So you don't have to worry about adding um, some sort of error to the number five, because if it was an error, it would have just jumped right here. OK. <clears throat> uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, I tried writing a function like this earlier today, but um, for some reason it's not working. OK. Um, do you want to share your screen and we can take a look? OK, so you're trying to read poem one, console log it, and then read poem two and console log that. <laughs> so I see what the problem is. Let me just um, take control of your screen for a second. So the problem is actually um, that dot then takes a callback function that will be executed when the previous promise is done um, versus what you were passing it, which was actually an, another promise. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't know how to deal with anything other than a callback function. Oh, OK. Yeah, that, that makes sense. OK. Cool. Um, so uh, we're going to do some pair programming now. Um, I'm going to split you out into breakout rooms, um, and you'll use flu bits. Um, 
So you see we've got this, um, you'll have uh, your Flubits uh, configuration files in your repository that will let you uh, share your code with each other and work on it together. Um, so let me just split you all up into your rooms. Um, let's uh, make four rooms. So I'm gonna add Hannah and Kimber to one room, then Matt and uh, Jeff, then Ani and Ashley, and um, finally Joel and Sean. And off you all go to pair. Good luck. So that's how the video classroom works. I hope you now have a better feel for the experience of being in a live lecture with one of our instructors. After each lecture, the instructor will pair up the students and get them started on the related workshop for that lecture. So let's look at what a workshop would look like inside of LearnDot. I'm going to show you the Data Structures Workshop, which is one of the first workshops that you would complete in the remote immersive. So I can just click on the tab to go inside. So on the left-hand side, you can see a navigation menu for the workshop. Each workshop is divided up into sections, or we also call them concepts, that relate to each topic within the workshop. So we can see that there's an introduction and with various pages inside of that. I'm going to take a look at part one, where I can see there are, we can implement a queue with an array, we're also seeing linked lists, and also implementing a queue using that linked list in the previous page. So I'm going to take a look at the linked list page. The content inside a workshop is a mixture of text, code blocks, diagrams, as well as editable, executable code that you can edit yourself. You may also find embedded videos that instructors made make throughout the workshops. As you go through the workshop, you can check off each concept as you complete them, and that will update the progress bar at the top of the workshop. So now that you have a good idea of how workshops uh, look, let's look through some of the other aspects of LearnDot. We've already gone through the video classroom, and we've already peeked at the workshop page. So let's take a look at the calendar. The calendar has an hourly schedule of the activities you would do each day. A typical day in the first half of the program would be a mixture of lectures, workshops, and reviews of those lectures. The calendar is a great way to know what's coming up, as well as staying synced with the rest of your classmates. So let's look at the next tab, Checkpoints. You'll take several checkpoints during your time in the Remote Immersive Program. Checkpoints are coding challenges that are meant to assess your knowledge of the material up to that point. When you're taking a checkpoint, you'd code out your solutions to the challenges in the text editor of your choice. Many of our students like to use Sublime, for example. Then you would run a suite of tests on your solution code using technologies such as Jasmine and Testum. And then you can upload your working solution to GitHub where an instructor can grade it. If you would like to know more about checkpoints, then you can click on the annotation you see right now on your screen. This will take you to a separate video that will walk through more in depth the experience of taking a checkpoint on our checkpoint platform. So, the the best part about our immersive is the level of support that you can get from instructors, teaching fellows, and your fellow students. So there are three main ways that you can get support. In the support tab, we can see the first two. Let's start off with office hours. Office hours are a way that you can schedule one-on-one -on -one time with an instructor or a teaching fellow. For example, if I want to schedule right here with John Chen, I can reserve this slot. And now I'll just release it for the, this example. So this is a great way to get help on anything that you're struggling with. The second part, the second piece of support that we have offered to you is our forum. So I'm going to open this up in a new tab. We call this forum Discuss. Discuss is a place where you can post your questions and then have your questions answered by other students. We've found that students really love helping out their classmates, and also that many of the long-lasting bonds that you'll make during the immersive start right here in Discuss. But really, the tool that you'll use the most often is what we call the help desk. And we can get to the help desk with the blue question mark in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. 
So let's just walk through this help desk piece by piece. I'm logged in as a student, Mark Davis. And I'm going to write out a question that I have so it can be answered by a teaching fellow or instructor. I have a question about conditionals. So I'm going to say, please help me with my conditional statements. I'll post the question, and then soon an instructor will post a response to my question. Great, so Griffin has answered my question and asked me what the problem is. So the best way for me to explain my problem is to post my code. So I have this button on the left side of the text screen where I can add a code snippet. So I'm going to add in my conditional statement that's broken, and I can send it to Griffin. So Griffin's going to take some time to look over my code and then send me back a working solution and help me figure out where I went wrong in the first place. OK, great. So he sees the problem, and he gives me information on how I can change my code to make it working. So I tell him thanks, and then I'll resolve the ticket. So the help desk is a great way for you to get support when you need it and is staffed by an amazing team of fellows and instructors so you can get help very quickly. All right, so there's one more thing I want to show you which you will use a lot when you are communicating with your fellow classmates and instructors, and that's Slack. Slack is a chat application where you can keep in touch with all aspects of the full stack community, including your classmates, instructors, fellows, as well as alumni and students across the organization. So here's an example of the current junior Slack channel. You can see it's a great place to com collaborate as well as put in resources and ask your instructors questions, as well as just socialize. So that concludes our tour of LearnDot, and we're reaching the end of this video. But there's something else I want to show you, something that's only available to our remote immersive students, and that's our VR lab. Virtual reality is a really cool technology that we are working with to implement inside of our online learning platforms. Because, well, it's online. Why not? This is the best place to start playing around, hacking with, and geeking out with virtual reality technology. So we are focusing on two different platforms. First, real world virtual reality. So for example, with YouTube's 360 video, we can live stream an immersive version of the full stack campus straight to you. Second, we have simulated world VR. For example, games such as WoW or Minecraft. So right now, we actually have a version of the full stack campus in Minecraft where students can socialize and hang out as well as continue to build upon that world. And to bring this to you in the physical world, we'll use various VR hardware and headsets so that you can experience this in a more immersive setting. So remember, this is only available to the remote immersive students. So if you have an interest in VR, either as a hobby or possibly a career path, then the remote immersive program could be a great fit for you. So that's what it would be like to be a student in our remote immersive program at Full Stack Academy. I hope you have a much better feel for the experience in terms of the day-to-day -day technologies, your activities each day, and most importantly, the interaction between you, the instructors, and your fellow classmates. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us at admissions at fullstackacademy.com. So good luck as you travel down your road to code.